Uh, in addition to everything else that he mentioned, we do also have a men's retreat coming up in May. We also have a one-day men's conference in April. We'll give you more information as those get closer. Uh, open your Bibles to Acts 27. Acts 27. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Most of you know my testimony, and I'm very excited because, as you know, we went through some difficult time with our boys a year back, uh, several years back, about seven years ago. I was in a coma for a long time, and three, all three of my boys kind of went sideways. The good news is they're all clean and sober and walking with the Lord, praise God. And my oldest son, who's been gone for three years in prison, is coming home on Wednesday. So Thursday night he'll be here, next Sunday he'll be at church. And he helped me with uh, the Bible study I teach out at the prison here to get a bunch of guys to come. So he's excited about being here, and I'm excited too. Amen. Praise God. Amen. All right, let's, let's open the word of prayer, and we'll dig into the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit teaches us. We thank you that you wrote it down, and then, Lord, your Holy Spirit gives us understanding. And, Lord, we ask right now as we go to your word, give us ears to hear Make this the most attentive hour of our week. Lord, may we not be thinking about tomorrow or checked out, but Lord, may we get our eyes on you and be ready to receive all you have for us. We thank you for your word that it's living and breathing and sharper than a two-edged sword. May it divide our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. By the way, if you don't have an outline, they are on the back table. I encourage you to grab an outline. It'll be up behind me as well as we go through the word. Uh, quick to catch you up, if you're already at Acts 27, by the way, if you need a Bible, we've got Bibles back there as well, uh, right? And if you need a Bible, if you don't have a Bible at home, take one of those Bibles as our gift. Uh, we, we don't want people to be without the Word of God. So the book of Acts, we're coming to the end of it. In the last several chapters, we've seen the Apostle Paul, who we know got radically saved. He was the arch enemy of the Christian church. He was Osama bin Laden of the day. And then he comes to know Jesus Christ. And now as a new creation in Christ, God begins to use him in a mighty and a powerful way. But God sends him first to the Gentiles. And we see him going from city to city, planting churches everywhere, people getting radically saved. But in the deep deepness of Paul's heart. He always had a burden for his own people. Because you see, before Paul was Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee. He was a religious man. And he loved the Jewish people because those were his people. So God finally gave him an opportunity to go back and minister to his people. But as if you've been here the last few weeks, he was warned ahead of time, when you go there, they're not going to receive you well. They're going to go after you. They're going to try to kill you. And what did Paul say? None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, but then I might finish my race with joy. See, Paul was not moved by temporary threats because you couldn't threaten him with heaven. Amen? And we as believers should not be moved by temporary threats. Our heart ought to be on the eternal and have an eternal perspective in everything that we do. So Paul went to Jerusalem, and sure enough, they began to beat him. They were going to beat him to death, and the Roman soldiers rescued him. But then as he was carried away, as the crowd was pressing in, as he got to a safe place with soldiers around him, he asked for an opportunity to preach the gospel to the very people trying to kill him. The following chapter, we saw that he was brought in front of the religious leaders and he brought the gospel to them. Then he was sent away to Caesarea without any charges against him, was in prison for two years for doing nothing wrong, under house arrest, chained up to guards. And what did he do? He saw that as another opportunity for the gospel. And if you were here last week, and if you weren't, I want to encourage you to get CDs as they come available. Last week's message, I titled Almost Persuaded. And if you were here last week, I can think of very few words more tragic than almost persuaded. Because Paul was then given an opportunity after two years in prison to stand in front of the governor and in front of the king and preach the gospel as this huge crowd was there and they came in with great pomp and everybody was all praising them and they thought Paul was on trial and the reality was the whole crowd was on trial because he brought before them the gospel. And if you'll remember, the governor Festus said, you've lost your mind. When you share your go the gospel with people, some people are going to think you've lost your mind. You really believe that there was an Adam and an Eve, and you really believe that God put all those animals in a boat? You really believe? Yes. Amen? I believe the Word of God. And you really believe that? Yes, I do. You believe the world's only 6,000 years old? Yes, I do. God created, God said it, that settles it. Amen? And here's the reality that he gets up, and as he preaches, Festus says, you've lost your mind, but then King Agrippa, even Saturn, said, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. 
Then they get together and they said, oh, if he just hadn't asked to go to Caesar, he had pled to go to Caesar. And as a Roman, they had to do that. He said, if not, we would just let him go. The religious leaders were angry. People were upset. Divine appointment after divine appointment. Now, this morning, we're going to pick up in Acts 27. And his whole journey is going to take a turn. And he's going to get on a boat. And he's going to be heading to Rome. Because God had promised he'd go to Rome. Probably he did not think he was going to get there on a boat. Didn't think probably, now remember, Paul's already been in multiple shipwrecks. Paul's already been beaten often. He's been in cold often and heat often. He's been in all kinds of trials and difficulty. And you know what? Every trial and difficulty that Paul went through, he looked as an opportunity for the gospel. Guys, the next time we want to complain about our circumstances, maybe we try to look at it from an eternal perspective and recognize that God will use it for his glory if we will let him. Can we say amen to that? Can we say amen to that? All right. So, I tell the message this morning, if you have your outline, if not, it's up behind me, in the midst of the storm. And we're going to see Paul's going to be in the midst of yet another storm. And we're going to see that Paul's going to use it as an opportunity for the gospel. And we're going to see different responses to Paul sharing with them the truth of what God has commanded him to say. So in our own lives, here's the applications. In the midst of the storm, God's plan for our lives isn't always what we expect. How many of you, your life has been exactly what you expected? Like when you were in high school or junior high and seventh grade, they said, write down what you want to do when you grow up. It happened exactly the way you thought. Anybody? No way, right? I mean, here's the reality. Did last week go exactly how you expected it to go? The reality is that in our lives, we kind of have plans and thoughts of, of how we expect life to go, but God has another plan. But here's the good news. God's in control and God knows what he's doing. Can we say amen to that? So even when the trials come, God is faithful. Even when it's not exactly what we want, we can still trust the Lord. Number two, in the midst of the storm, God's plans often different than what we expect. Number two, there's a disaster when we disregard godly counsel. Can we all say amen to that? Amen. Have you ever been given godly counsel and then decided just not to do it? Anybody besides just me? And how's that work out usually? And you know what? Here's the reality. It's sad because we've been on the receiving end and we've been on the sharing end. Have you ever shared with somebody when you so clearly see, dude, this is a horrible decision. Don't do this. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what you're going to do. Don't do it. And they're like, I'm doing it. And you watch it, and they do it, and you see the disaster unfold in front of you. How many of you have seen that happen? And sometimes we're the ones on the receiving end. Don't do it. And we do it anyway. And then the disaster comes, and we shake our fist to God. Sometimes. Amen? How dare you let me disobey you and then have it blow up in my face, God, when you were trying to protect me? But that's what happens. So the, in the midst of the storm, the, the, there's a disaster when we disregard Godly counsel, we'll see that this morning. And then we need to know that storms are not always just storms of correction. Sometimes they're storms of perfection. Sometimes the storms in life are brought on by our disobedience. Can we say amen to that? We choose to disobey, and then the consequences come. But sometimes we're walking in the center of God's will, and the storm comes. So some storms are storms of correction because we've disobeyed God, but others are storms of perfection where God is allowing us to go through a storm that he might mold us more to the image of his son. On this same boat, there's going to be some where it's a storm of correction, where at the same time for Paul, it's a storm of perfection. The same trial can be different in each person's life, depending on where we are with the Lord. And then finally, when you're in the midst of the storm, take heart, God's in control. Isn't it good to know that God's in control? Isn't it good to know when you're thumbing through Facebook and looking at people's ridiculous comments on things that God's in control? Isn't it good to know when you look at the government or you look at your neighborhood or you look at the world we live in today and the things that offend people and the things that people are, are caught up in and the things that people are pursuing? Isn't it good to know that God is in control? Isn't it good to know when you got a guy in North Korea threatening to blow up our country that God is in control? God's in control. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. You plus God is a majority. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So guys, I'm so glad that God's in control. And it gives me total peace. I don't sweat anything. I really don't. I don't worry about it. Dude, my best friend created the universe. Amen? Why am I worried about anything? Fear, anxiety, and worry are all the opposite of faith. So let's begin there. 
Acts 27, we're going to be changing gears. Paul was just standing in front of this massive crowd. He's just preached the gospel with boldness. Some called him crazy. The religious leaders are about to pop a head gasket, ah, angry. And over here, we had one who was almost persuaded. Now, chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners and to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. You know, some of these chapters, this is one of those chapters, how many of you guys read this chapter before you came to church? God bless you guys, okay? It's okay to read ahead. Can we say amen? It's okay to read ahead. It's not, we're not, you know, it's not cheating. It's an open book test, okay? You can read ahead. But you know what? This is one of those chapters where you might read through it and it just looks like a bunch of traveling stuff. Well, then they moved here and then the storm came up and they came over here. But I want you to know that there's nothing in the word of God by chance. Can we say amen to that? It's all in the Bible for a reason and God has it here. So they decided to sail to Italy. So it had been determined by God's counsel long before the council of Festus that Paul would go to Rome. But God's sovereign plan had a divine appointment, not just in Rome, but on the way there. Have you ever thought about the fact that ministry is not a destination, it really is a way of life and we're all in it? Can we say amen to that? And too often we think, well, when I get there, I'll do ministry. Well, when I come to this place, I'll, when I'm older, when my kids have grown up, when I'm more educated. But the reality is, if you're a Christian, you're in ministry right now. Amen? And here's the reality for Paul. Even though he's headed to Rome, where ministry awaits him, ministry is available, is a part of his life every single day. So ministry is not a destination. So he's getting thrown onto a ship... And often you can think, well, I'm just going to be traveling, so I'm going to take a nap. And then when I get there, I'll do ministry. I'll tell you some of my, the best ministry opportunities I've ever had have been on planes to, to go do ministry. By the way, captive audience, I love to get the aisle seat, and I got you for 17 hours, bro. Where are you going? Amen? And you get a chance to talk to people about the Lord. So they're gonna, he's going to get on a ship to go to Italy, where God had said he would go. He would appear in Rome before Caesar. That's going to be a great opportunity. I'm going to go tell Caesar about the Lord. Everything that they put me through, even though I'm in prison without any accusations, it's okay because it's going to give an opportunity for the gospel. So all his traveling companions were prisoners for the most part, and the soldiers. I have not, there's not a doubt in my mind that Paul witnessed to every prisoner on that ship. They're going to be together for quite a while, about five months. And while they're traveling, while they're going through these, diff these trials that they're going through, he's going to have an opportunity. There's 260 plus people on board. He's going to witness, not doubt my mind, witness to every one of them. But not only is he going to witness to the prisoners, he's going to have an opportunity to witness to the, the people that are, are on the ship, that are guiding the ship. He's going to have an opportunity to witness to all the soldiers on board. See, the reality is Paul looked at everything from an eternal perspective. And the truth is when you go to work tomorrow, you might just think, well, I'm, I'm at work and this is just how I provide for my family. And certainly that could be true and that should be true. But the reality is the number one reason you're there is to be salt and light. Amen? The number one reason you're walking through the grocery store is to be, God provides for you. But wherever we go, we are called to be salt and light. We're called to represent Jesus Christ. We're called to pray and look for divine appointments. So Paul's getting on a ship. Everyone else getting on that ship has a different perspective than Paul. Well, we got to get to Rome. Get on a boat. Paul's like, all right, this is the divine appointment put in front of me today. These are the opportunities I'm going to have to share with people the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one that God has placed in your life is there by chance. They're all by divine appointment. And again, all these traveling companions were confined to a ship with the apostle Paul. And they were going to hear the gospel. Verse 2. So entering a ship at a, a, a drapthium... We put to sea, meaning to sail to the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, Thessalonica, was with us. So they were going to go to the sea port in Mycenae. They entered what was probably a privately owned cargo ship headed to a larger port city where they could board a larger grain vessel headed to Rome. So first he's in a smaller ship. So he's got less people with him. And they're going to get on this boat. And again, they're going to think, to some degree, that this is just by chance. Aristarchus was among the delegates who accompanied Paul with a collection from the Gentile churches. You know what's interesting to me? 
Guess who's on this ship with him? And they don't even, the, first of all, the guy who's on the ship with him, first one is the one who wrote this book, Luke. Is Luke a prisoner? What's the answer? No. But he's hanging out with the prisoners because he feels called to do so. He voluntarily, in a sense, imprisons himself so he can do ministry. Aristarchus is someone who had gone with Paul in all the Gentile cities to go bring an offering to the Jews. And what does he do? He gets on the ship with the prisoners as well. He, they're doing time on purpose. They're volunteering to spend time with these prisoners and with the Apostle Paul to encourage Paul, but also to do ministry alongside him. Most of you know that we have people in our church go, to, go into prisons on Sunday afternoon, Monday nights, and Wednesday nights. And you know why? Because those people need to hear about Jesus. Can we say amen to that? Just like everyone else out here does. When you minister to, when you, when you come to prison, it's ministering to the Lord. I go on to prison every Monday night, and I love what God's doing out there. People getting saved on fire for God. So Paul must have thanked God for his faithful friends who gave up their own freedom, even risked their lives to minister to Paul and to accompany him in a time of great difficulty. Can I encourage you? Christianity is not for the Lone Ranger. Amen? If you're trying to walk the Christian life all by yourself, you're going to fail. Forsake not the gathering yourselves together and all the more as the day approaches. We need people around us who love the Lord, who will hold up our hands in time of difficulty. As iron sharpens iron, so a man builds up the countenance of his friend. Amen? Have you ever noticed you get in the most trouble when you isolate yourself? Can we say amen to that? When you go isolate yourself, when you don't spend time with God's people, uh, the most greatest amount of temptation comes when you're alone. And we need to be... So what a blessing for Paul... And that because he was under house arrest, even though he'd been arrested, he had some freedom where his friends could come with him. And he had brothers who voluntarily set their lives aside to go with Paul, to minister to him, and to minister with him. You've heard me say it many times, blood is thicker than water, but the Holy Spirit's thicker than blood. Amen? And we got Jesus in common, we got everything in common. Can we say amen to that? Some of you I just met today, we got Jesus in common, we're family. Amen? And that's a joy, and that's a get to, and that's a blessing. Verse 3. And the next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. So they traveled 80 miles. They did it all in one day on a boat, and Julius treated Paul kindly. Julius is a Roman centurion. You know what's interesting to me in the Bible? Every Roman centurion you see in the Bible is a man of character. Every one of them. Every time you see a Roman centurion, it's amazing how God uses them. A centurion said to Jesus in Luke 7, Speak the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. This man had authority over other men. And he said to Jesus, if you'll just say the word, I know he'll be healed. You don't even have to come. That's called faith. Amen? In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius was the first Gentile convert. And it was Gentile Pentecost took place in his house because he was seeking the Lord. And the Lord said, go send for Peter and have him come. He brought him there, brought his whole family in. Everybody got saved. And you know what? It was a Roman centurion, another man of character. It was a Roman centurion at the cross of Calvary that said, truly, this man is the son of God. So here's Julius, another commendable man. And I want you to notice what he did here. He trusted Paul. They landed on shore. Paul's a prisoner. And he let Paul leave. And go into town and meet his Christian friend and hang out with them and trusted him to come back when it was time for the boat to move on. Uh, you don't do that with prisoners. They won't come back. But Paul had an appointment with Rome. And Paul wasn't going anywhere. Paul could have left. Paul could have fled. But he trusted in the sovereignty of God. Again, it wasn't the way he thought he'd get there. And there's going to be some great trials that are about to come. But Paul is faithful even in the midst of it. Verse 4 and 5. And when we put out to sea, from there we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. They kept near the shore when they were sailing to, to avoid it because the winds were so radical, it was very difficult. Nothing is worse for sailing than 
too heavy of wind. And the wind, especially when the wind is blowing in the opposite direction of where you want to go. I want to tell you, I'll tell you a quick story because I find, I find it uh, interesting as I read this text, I'm reminded of it. Many years ago, I went deep sea fishing for the only time. I went deep sea fishing. <laughs> and when we went, it was, I was in Lancaster and a whole bunch of guys from our church, they were all police officers and they had a bunch of police officer friends in Texas. They all flew out and we we're going to do a 36 hour deep sea fishing trip. And when we got there, it was storming and they came into, t- I'm eating a Monte Cristo. Do you know what a Monte Cristo is? It's a deep fried sandwich. I would regret that later, okay? But here's the reality. I'm eating a Monte Cristo. The captain comes in. There's like 30 of us in this uh, banquet area of a restaurant getting ready to go out. And he goes, guys, sorry, but we're going to have to cancel. Small craft advisories. All the other charters have canceled. We're not going out. And then, of course, and I love police officers. Praise God for police officers. But a couple of them were like, what? You afraid to go out? We came all the way here from Texas. We're not afraid. You know what? You won't take us out? You know, what kind of wimpy captain are you? Rah, rah, rah. And I'm sitting over here. I've never been sick in my life. I've got a cast iron stomach. I'm eating a Monte Cristo. And the guy says, all right, you guys want to go? Get on the boat. <laughs> so we got on the boat. And he said, by the way, as soon as we leave, we're not coming back for 36 hours. <laughs> as soon as we cast out, I don't care. We're not coming back. So we get out. It's only a few hours. And I'm actually doing okay. But you know what? When everyone around you is throwing up, what happens to you? And I'm out on the thing, and the guy's bar- the guy barfed on my leg, and I got thrown up all around me. They're puking on. So I go in and lay in my bunk. The guy in the bunk above me pukes on me. I go out, I'm standing on the edge of the thing, and before, oh, you're feeding the fish. 36 hours. Oh my good. I would have paid $10,000 for a helicopter to get me off of that boat. I learned then contrary wind, not a good thing. We don't want that. Amen. By the way, I lost nine pounds in 36 hours and I had to take two days off of work because when I got home, the bed keeps, doesn't it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I had seasickness at home. So when I read stuff like this, and oh, dude, I get that. The one thing I told the guys after the trip, I said, you know, people used to say, what was the worst day of your life? I used to not have an answer. Got one now. (laughs) So they're on a ship. Wind's kicking up, and they're hugging to the side of the island to keep from, you know, dealing with what a storm can do to a ship. Sidon to Myra was... 450 to 500 miles. So this is about a 15-day trip. Isn't it amazing in the Bible? And they got on a boat and they sailed here. It was 500 miles. It was 15 days out there in the wind getting beat up. And they're headed to Rome, traveling along the shore again. Paul could see numerous cities along the way, by the way. You know, all the cities where he had planted churches, as he's going along the shore, he was passing by these cities where he had planted churches and it no doubt ministered to Paul's heart. And he was no doubt praying for them. So they're on this small ship. They finally make it to Myra, verse 6. Then there was a centurion. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy and he put us on board. So from Egypt headed to Italy, this was a huge grain ship. We're going to see later there were 300 people on this ship. So it's a big ship. And Paul's just going from divine appointment to divine appointment to divine appointment. And in each one of them, he's doing what God wants him to do. He's headed to where God wants him to go. But it doesn't mean there aren't going to be storms along the way, even as you obey God. Can we say amen to that? Well, if you were just, well, if you were just had faith, you would never have any trials. Uh, false prophet says that. Amen? You see this on Christian television. If you just had faith, you would never have. Uh, show me somebody in the Bible used mildly that didn't suffer greatly. There aren't any. Amen? And so Paul's just being faithful. He's doing what God's called to do. And he thought it was tough on the small ship. It's about to get a lot tougher. And yet God's going to use this for his glory. God's plan isn't always what we expect, verse 7 and 8. When he had sailed slowly by for many days, 
When we had sailed slowly for many days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salome. You know what's in it, Solomon? You know what's interesting is they're passing with difficulty, again due to strong winds, and only a taste of what was about to come. So they're going to, notice there, they come to a place called Fair Havens. And they're in this place where they're actually safe, but Fair Havens is a little podunk town. And if they don't get out quickly, they're going to be stranded there for three to four months. And the sailors that are on the ship do not want to winter in Fairhaven because it's like wintering in, I don't know, Joshua Tree or something, right? I mean, they, they're like, there's nothing here. We got to get on the ship and we want to get to a big town where there's a bunch of stuff going on so they can remain in Fairhaven and be safe. But they're not going to want to do that. They're going to want to be moved by not the Lord, but moved by the flesh and go to a place where they can feed their fleshly desires as opposed to spending several months in Fairhaven. And now Paul's going to come in and give them some godly counsel. And they're going to have to make a choice as to what they want to do. So due to strong winds, they're there. Each leg of the trip was becoming more and more difficult. Those on the ship didn't want to be stuck there. Again, they would rather uh, weather a storm and take chances with their life than be in a place where they could be safe. So point number one, God's plan for our lives isn't what we expect. Paul didn't expect any of this, but God put him there. It was a divine appointment. It was a part of his life. God's using it. He's ministering to people along the way. Now we're going to see the disaster of disregarding godly counsel. Verse nine. Now, when much time had been spent and the sailing was now dangerous because of the fast was already over, Paul advised them. The fast here is speaking of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement when they would fast. And they would wait upon the Lord. This was also the day when the uh, priest previously to Jesus dying on the cross would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of the Lamb on the Ark of the Covenant. So this is a reminder of the atoning work of the cross of Calvary, of what Christ had done. Uh, again, for the Jewish people, that day of atonement was always pointing to the cross, even though they didn't understand it. So Paul has fasted. He spent time in God's presence. And now he's going to give godly counsel to those who are traveling with him. Now, the fact that it's the day of the fast tells us where we are. In the, uh, it's October. And now it's about to get really rough. Winter's kicking in. And they're concerned. It's getting a rough time of the year. And he's going to give them godly counsel based on both their circumstances and from hearing from the Lord. Every sailor knew that sailing was difficult from mid-September to mid-November, virtually impossible from mid-November to February. It was heavy fog, low visibility, severe storms, but these guys did not want to hang out in Fairhaven. They're going to be longing for Fairhaven pretty quick. They're going to be wishing, dreaming of Fairhaven pretty soon. Have you ever done something where you just step away from God's will because well, I, I want to just, and, and you go out here and you're like, man, I, I would like to go back to where I was. Do we say amen to that? Can I go back to there? We're going to see. Now watch what happens in verse 10. Remember, Paul is a prisoner, but that doesn't make him bashful. Amen. Paul's in prison. Paul's imprisoned. Paul has guards. Paul has you know, they're taking him to Rome and Paul is unashamed. And sometimes we think I can't share my faith because I don't have a position of authority. You know what? We have a position of authority. We're in Christ. Amen. And that means we have an opportunity and an obligation anywhere and everywhere we go, not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and not to be ashamed of when the Lord speaks to us. Verse 10, watch what happens. Men, I perceive that this voyage will end in disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo ship, but also of our lives. Now, who's he telling this to? Sailors. Is Paul a sailor? What's the answer? No. He's a rabbi. Used to be. Now he's an evangelist. But he's a prisoner. And it'd be like one of those cops telling the captain what you afraid to say i mean right they'd be like dude i know about this is what i do for a living don't tell me but i will say this paul's been in shipwrecks paul does know the ocean but more importantly paul knows god amen and paul had fasted he had prayed he had spent time in god's presence so he comes to him and goes guys bad idea 
I don't think we should sail. Matter of fact, all their money was tied up in cargo, right? We've got prisoners on the ship with guys who are working the ship and delivering cargo. And like, you're going to lose everything you have that makes you money. Plus, some of you are going to die. I'm thinking that's pretty heavy counsel. How do they respond? So a tent maker by trade, a rabbi by profession, a prisoner by decree. He had been shipwrecked three times and spent an entire day and night in the open ocean. He knows a little bit about what happens at sea, but more importantly, he knows the God who commands the sea. The word there, he says, I perceive. That word in the Greek is to perceive from ex past experience. Paul had experienced practically and discernment prophetically, and the men in charge are going to give him little attention. If you're a prisoner, go shut up and get back to where you're, go, go back to, go sit down. Don't tell us anything. You're not going to give us any direction. Who are you to talk to us? They're going to listen to him later. Verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. They're going to disregard godly counsel and they're going to heed the words of the captain, the owner and the crew instead. Guys, here's what happens in our lives. We can listen to the world or we can listen to God. Can we say amen to that? Does the world vote for stuff and are they wrong? Amen. Remember what happened to Moses? The children of Israel voted to go back to Egypt. It was three million to two. That was the vote. Moses and God are right. Amen? And you know what? That's the, the thing. We'll, you'll be discussing things with people, but, well, but you know, our culture has decided, our culture is from the pit of hell and needs Jesus. How about that? Amen? Amen? Pastor Dave, that's not very kind. It's reality. The reality is we live in a world right now that cares only about its flesh. Everybody's offended if you look at them sideways. We're living in a world right now that so desperately needs Jesus. And yet at the same time, people will take the counsel of the world. By the way, I don't care what the world thinks about anything. You know why? They're wrong. God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? And sadly, some Christians will go to the world for counsel. The Bible says to walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. I don't need the counsel of men. I need the counsel of Almighty God. Amen? So God says, Paul, bad idea. Paul goes to them. I hung out with God. He said, bad idea. Yeah, but the sailors think it's a great idea, so we're going to go. Let's see how this is going to go. Let's see what happens when God commands one thing and the world says something else and we do what the world says instead of doing what God says. It's practical application of all of our lives. This isn't just a traveling uh, thing we're reading through here. It has application to our lives. Verse 12, And because the harbor was not yet suitable to winter in, and the majority advised to set sail from there also, by any means, they could reach Phoenix. People were, see, people were wintering in Phoenix all the way back then. A harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. So Fair Haven's a sleepy little place. Not enough entertainment for the sailors during a long, those long winter months. Wanting to get to Phoenix to winter there. Livelier city, more to do. The sailors risking harm in pursuit of entertainment and feeding the flesh. Does that sound like the world we live in today? I will... I will risk harm so that my flesh can be fed. I will do things that could bring destructive things to my life so my flesh will be fed. Everyone doing drugs, that's true. Amen? Drinking, partying, the night scene, sleeping, all these train wrecks, these choices people make, recognizing this may bring me harm, but I don't care. I just want the instant pleasure that's coming right now. Well, these are the sailors. Look, we want, we'll, we'll risk our lives to get to the place where we want to be, even though we've been told by a man of God who's speaking with kindness but also boldness, bad idea. They sided with the world and didn't listen to the Lord. So here comes the storm. And as I said, this is both the storm of correction and a storm of perfection. Correction for those who are choosing to disobey God and perfection for a godly man who goes through it with them. For him, he's going to have an opportunity to grow and see God move. And for them, they're going to have an opportunity to face the righteous judgment of God for not listening. Amen? And I've been in both storms. How about you? Watch what happens. Verse 13. 
When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. So the wind blew softly in a favorable direction, and they felt confirmed in their decision. Guys, sometimes we will go contrary to God's will, and for a period of time, it'll look like God said it was okay. See, I did it anyway, and nothing happened. I've been, I've been cheating on my taxes every year. For I've never got arrested. I've been sleeping with my girlfriend. I've been going out and partying. I've been leaving work early and chucking out. I've been doing all these things and no one's caught me. God must be okay. God's grace does not equal God's permission. Amen? And so for a minute, it, they almost probably looked at Paul. Dude, look. It's blowing softly in our direction. And you wanted us to stay in Fairhaven. Right? Guess what? Just because you get away with it for a, a little bit doesn't mean you're going to get away with it forever. Again, God suffers long, but he won't suffer always. Amen? And we'll use any sign of goodwill that you can go in a different, opposite direction of God's word. And at first, way, you may be blown along softly. But guess what? The storm of correction's coming, I promise. So, four reasons that make this a perfect example of how not to know God's will as you sail through life. Here's how four things, if you're taking notes, they're on your, on your list, but how do you, what are four things you can do to know that you're not listening to God? First of all, the sailors were impatient. How many of you have ever been impatient in your prayer life? Be honest. Hands up, you're lying. Okay. <laughs> Don't we get impatient? God, I've been praying about this for three days. I don't understand why you haven't given me an answer. Not only the answer, but the answer I want. I've been praying. God, you need to do what I want you to Come on, give me patience right now. You know, that kind of mentality. And we have this mentality with God. Well, the first thing you can do to miss God's will in the midst of a storm is being patient. Instead of saying, okay, God, you allowed me to be here. You're going to use this for your glory. Help me, Lord, to trust you. Amen? Help me, Lord, to trust you. They're impatient. It's not a season to sail. They wanted to go anyway. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, kind patience. Amen? Isn't patience hard? Can we say amen to that? It's hard to be patient. You're at the drive through and the guy's taking 37 seconds to get your food, and you're banging on the stairs. What's going on around here? In 47 seconds, we get this mentality that everything has to be right now. And here we are in the midst of a trial. Holy Spirit's not the author of confusion. So the first thing is they were impatient. The second thing is they took a vote. God's way is not democratic. Amen? As I used to tell my kids growing up, you are not being raised in a democracy. Dad's in charge and God's in charge of dad. Amen? Otherwise, my four kids would have been voting and we'd be eating, we'd be eating cotton candy for breakfast. Amen? I mean, if the kids are in charge, what a nightmare that is. Guys, if we're in charge, we're going to make horrible choices. Amen? So they took a vote. So they were impatient they took a vote. They tested the wind. They were moved by their circumstances to determine their course. Not outward circumstances, but inward conviction that should be our leading. Sometimes people will move because outwardly it just makes sense. And I'm not saying when it outwardly makes sense, God won't do it. But too often, we make that the determining fact. Well, if I move there, it's cheaper to live. God may move you somewhere where it's cheaper to live. But make sure the Holy Spirit's moving you, not just your circumstances. Can we say amen to that? I've seen people move for a promotion. I've seen people move for cheaper real estate. And then they get there and their walk with God falls apart. The enemy will tempt you with that which seems good. I'm not saying that God won't move you to a cheaper place. But again, make sure it's the Lord. Amen? Too often it's, well, I'll be moved by the world, and then when I get there, I'll try to find a place to worship. Maybe you should find the place God's called you to serve and worship, and then get a job there. How about that? That's backwards. Putting God first. How dare we? That's insane. Here's the reality. These guys are voting on things. They're testing the wind. They're being moved by their circumstances instead of following the Lord. And then finally, the sailors were seeking comfort. Why do they want to leave Fairhaven? Because they want to be comfortable. So they've set out. Seems to be going their way. So, want to know God's will? Don't be impatient. Don't seek to do what's popular with men. Don't be moved by your outward circumstances, but the inward conviction of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, don't seek what's physically the most comfortable, but what's spiritually the Lord's, the Lord's best for me. Amen? 
Where does God want me to be? How does God want to use me? Verse 14. So we've seen those pictures there. I pray for all of us that we would learn from their example. Now watch what happens. Seems to be going well. Verse 14. But not long after, a tempestuous wind rose called a Eurocliton. It wasn't long before the soft wind became a huge storm. Correction, consequence of unbelief and disobedience. The word tempestuous is the English word typhoon. They're sailing along and a typhoon came up. So now they went from being in a place of safety, a place where they could have lodged through the winter months, but because of their desire for physical pleasure, because of their being moved by their circumstances and not listening to the Lord, because they disobeyed the commands of God, because they were impatient, now they're going to find themselves in a huge mess. And that can happen to us as well. We're moved by the world instead of listening to the Lord. No longer did they launch out then that soft wind became a northeastern blowing typhoon. Sin always promises gentle pleasure and it always delivers harsh consequences. Can I say that one more time? Sin always promises gentle pleasure and it always delivers harsh consequences. Can we say amen to that? King David, looking down, sees Delilah. He usually was fighting in the battles, and now he'd become complacent. He's sleeping until the middle of the day. Instead of leading the army, he's become lazy. He looks out and sees a woman, and he takes her. And you know what? Over the next several chapters, there's 12 consequences that come into David's life. Death of his children, harm to his own people, destruction of his character, loss of everyone's respect, all because of a momentary desire for pleasure that tells you and promises you that it will be gentle pleasure when really what it brings is harsh consequences. Amen? Next time the enemy's tempting you and telling you it'll be a gentle pleasure, and the Lord already forgave you anyway, so it's okay. The Lord does forgive you, but the consequences remain. Amen? Well, guess what? Consequences coming to these brothers right here. And the, and the interesting part is Paul's in the boat with them. What, did Paul do anything wrong? What's the answer? Did Paul want to do God's will? What's the answer? Did Paul warn the people that trouble was coming? What's the answer? But Paul still went through it with them. But for them, it was a storm of correction. For him, it's a storm of perfection, of God doing a work in his life. Now watch what happens in verse 15. By the way, a Euroclidon, that's a heavy-duty word. It literally, again, it was a typhoon, and then Euroclidon means a northeasterner. Again, when they first sailed out, the wind was blowing from the different direction. Now it's blowing the exact opposite way of the way they want to go. So when the ship was caught and could not head in the wind, we let her drive. They let the ship drift on its own. They couldn't steer it anymore to steer uh, to, to succumb to it. They just it lost control. It just started, they had to just let go and let it go where it was going to go. Isn't that what sin does to us? We step out into it and before you know it, there's nothing you can do. Consequences are coming, man. Here it is. It's too late now. I should have never been here to begin with. Well, now they just had to, they just had to sit in a ship and let it go. And it was going to take them where it wanted to go because they couldn't fight against it. Verse 16. And running under the shelter of an island called Clouda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. Blown 23 miles to the south to the island of Clouda. They, they went 23 miles off, off course and ended up on an island in the exact opposite direction they wanted to. Fairhaven sounded pretty good right now. Amen? They've been blown off shore. The skiff is the boat attached to the boat. And they had to, they're trying to hang on to that because in case this boat sinks, we've got to have a boat to get into. So they're doing everything they can, they can to hold that boat together. The small boat towed behind them, lest it be destroyed and they be lost. Guys, before it's over, they're 23 miles off course right now. They're going to be 500 miles off course before it's over. 500 miles. Fairhaven sounded pretty good. Amen? Has it ever happened in your own life where you have one little compromise? That now leads to another little compromise. That leads to another little compromise. And before you know it, how in the world did I get here? Can we say amen to that? I, I, I said I would never. And then I did. 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 And then and now I'm... People don't go from a, a loving, God-fearing marriage to committing adultery overnight. It's one little compromise that leads to another little compromise that leads to another little compromise. And the same is true with every sin. Amen? 
You just start compromising a little bit, and before you know it, you're all the way over here. They disobeyed God 500 miles off track, out of the way, mess, because they didn't heed godly counsel. Verse 17, when they had taken it on board the skiff, they used, the fear, they used and fearing lest they should run aground on Serta Sands, they, struck, they stuck sail and so were driven. So they pulled the sail up because they were afraid they were going to hit the ground. By the way, ground right here would have been good. If you're on the, you know what I wanted when I was on that ship? Ground. Give me some ground. Can I have ground, please? I got off the ship and I, 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 I was tempted to kiss the, I didn't, but I was tempted. Thank you, Jesus, for the ground. Amen. Being run ashore. See, right now they're more concerned about the ship than their own safety, but at some point you have to recognize this mess came because of what I chose to do. There's even worse consequences if I continue in it but they're going to continue in it. Verse 18 and 19. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. The storm continues to grow, and the crew did not all they could to keep it afloat. They started throwing their cargo, their grain overboard, then the ship's furniture, even cutting their mast that weren't absolute, anything that wasn't necessary, they're getting rid of it. How is this working out, disobeying God? How is this working out so far? Their ship's falling apart. They're taking all their profit and throwing it into the ocean. They're throwing away all the stuff they're going to need later. They're not even worried about how they're even going to pay for food. Down. They're not going to have any food, no grain. All these months of sailing are going to be worth nothing. Why? Because they disobeyed God. Because they thought they were smarter than God. Lord, help us. Amen? Verse 20. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. How did they navigate in those days? Stars. No stars, got no idea where you are, got no idea what direction you're going in, and you're lost. So these guys who are talking bad to Paul, like, you're an idiot, go over there, and we're sailors, we know what we're doing. Take us out there, we don't care, everybody else isn't going, we want to go. Uh, okay, 36 hours of pain, Amen. And here's the same thing happening here. God is giving direction through Paul. They decide to go on the... And the thing about it is Paul's on the ship with them. Is he suffering along with them? What's the answer? Yeah. Paul could have shaked his fist to God. Paul's not going to do that. Guys, when we succumb to sin, it renders us ineffective for ministry. It blows our testimony. Uh, lost cargo. Our lives don't produce any fruit. It causes us to lose direction. Again, they had no idea where they were going. Their lives were a mess. These, these veteran sailors all of a sudden now are at the wind, and they've given up all hope. I know someone on the boat's not giving up hope. Who would that be? Apostle Paul. The Lord told him he was going to make it to Rome. So guess what? He's making it to Rome. Amen? Everyone else is panicking. We don't need to. I don't panic about threats against our, against our nation. I don't panic. I certainly don't worry about global warming or whining or whatever you want to call it. I don't worry about it. You know why I don't worry about it? Because God's in control. And I think it's a bunch of nonsense anyway. You can disagree with me and God bless you. But here's the reality. There's things that people get so whipped up about that there's a warming coming. It's not global. It's eternal if you don't know Jesus. Can we say amen to that? We need to be more concerned about people's eternity than getting caught up in these things that just don't matter. Whatever. Doesn't the world want to distract us away from what really matters? Getting into debates about nonsense. Let's talk about Jesus. Amen? Where are you going to spend eternity? Nothing else matters. Final point. Take heart. God is in control. Here's the good news. So now watch. Paul's going to step up. Everybody's panicking now. They didn't want to listen to him before. All of a sudden, got a better audience. Because they got nothing. Dude, we're all going to die. We're doomed. We're all going to die. What are we going to do? And this, this is the whole ship full of people. Gulliver's Travels, if you were a kid, you know who I'm talking about. We're all going to die. Oh, no. That's that guy walking around. with It'll never work. Well, that, now this is a whole ship full of them. And watch what Paul does. I love Paul. I love this guy. After I hang out with Jesus for about a million years, I want to go have, you know, a heavenly burrito with Paul, right? So he's going to deliver God's message. And he's going to have faith in the midst of the storm. Guys, it's easy to have faith when you're on the cruise ship. Amen? When it's comfortable, when there's no problems, when everything's good, 
There's no worries in life. But you know what? Real faith is seen when we all think we're done. We're in a place where we're desperate, where we can't fix it, where everything's a mess. I never imagined being here. We're 500 miles off. I don't even know where we are. We can't see the stars. The place is pitching. We've thrown everything overboard. We're all going to die. Here's where real faith shows up, and Paul's going to show it. Look at verse 21. First thing he's going to do is share the word with them. Look what it says there. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them all and said, Men, you should have listened to me. Paul gives him an I told you so. How about that? Paul's like, should have listened. Just saying. Now, I don't think he's doing that to rub it in as much as it is he is so that they'll listen to him now. Amen? Like, guys, you should have listened to me then, but you can listen to me now. I have some important things to share with you. And there's what he says. Should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. So they're all hungry. Paul tells them you should have listened. If we had stayed, we could have avoided this. Heeding godly counsel steers us clear of disaster and sin's consequences. Paul didn't remind them of the prophetic uh, accuracy of the words to heap more guilt, but to give an even greater credibility what he's about to say. And so he says, take heart. Guys, we're in the midst of the storm. We've lost our bearing. We're fighting for our lives. We've given up all hope. But Paul's word of encouragement is, good news, guys, no one's going to die. Would that be good news at that point? What do you think? What does everybody think? We're all going to die. Paul says, here's the good news. We're going to lose the ship, but no one on the ship's going to die. Praise God. How can he speak with such confidence when everybody else, when the most veteran of sailors has given up hope when those who know how to go through a tempest and a storm has thrown their hands up in the air and given up how is it that paul can speak with such confidence because paul hung out with god amen we can speak with confidence when everyone's panicking if we're hanging out with god amen if you're in the word every day if you're spending time in prayer if you're seeking his face you don't have to panic You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be anxious. God's in control. It's okay. Paul's word of encouragement, no loss of life. You're just going to lose the stuff. We're going to lose stuff, but no eternal souls are going to be lost right here. And that's what's most important. Look at verse 23. Now watch this. This is good stuff. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Who's that? Who do you think that is? Who do you think that is? It's Jesus. There's no doubt. Whom I serve. Does he serve angels? He serves Jesus. Amen? The Lord showed up on the ship and spoke to Paul. Guys, you know what? It's better to be in a storm with Jesus than out of a storm without him. Amen? It's better to be in the deepest trial in the world and have the Lord show up and comfort you and speak into your life than for you to be on a cruise ship where you forget about the Lord and you cease to be desperate for Him. Can we say amen to that? God shows up in the midst of the storm. Remember when the apostles were going across the Sea of Galilee and they hit a great storm? And do you remember that Jesus came walking up to them on the waves? You guys remember that? And they thought He was a ghost? You know why? They weren't looking for Him. Can I encourage you, if you're in a storm right now, start looking for Jesus in the midst of it. Amen? Start looking for the Lord. I'm going through a difficult time, but God's with me, and he wants to speak to me, and I'm going to keep my eyes open for Jesus in the midst of this. I'm not going to be defeated. I'm not going to walk around angry and bitter. I'm going to be looking for the Lord. I've got to pick it up. I've got a lot of verses left. It says there, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must... Be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who will sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as he told me. Paul doesn't just speak with confidence, but then he tells them why he's confident. I'm confident because the Lord came and told me, and now I'm telling you. Guys, we can speak with authority and boldness, If we've heard from the Lord, you know why we have a hard time sharing our faith because we don't spend enough time in God's presence. Can we say amen to that? 
Too often what happens is, well, I don't know what to say. And I don't if you've been hanging out with the Lord, he'll, he'll show you what to say. Amen? If you're spending time in his presence, if you're seeking his face, God will show up in a mighty way. Angel came to Paul. You know, Paul was in Jerusalem being persecuted, and Jesus came and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as I testified to you before, you're, you're going to go to, you will go to Rome. So the angel stood with him all night to assure him of God's promise, do not fear. Again, I believe this is the Lord, and Paul shares God's word of encouragement with the men and tells them to take heart. In spite of the storm, in spite of your lost bearing, being driven by the wind, in spite of the desperation and overwhelming situation, despite of all the physical circumstances and your perspective, I believe God, and it will be just as he says. You know, in the midst of trials, people are looking for someone with faith. Is that true? I remember when my office, most of you know I have a full-time job. My office in San Jose many years ago, they announced there were going to probably be layoffs. And all these people were panicking. And people were panicking. And they were like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And oh no. And people were just up in arms. This is back in the early 90s. And everybody was just up in arms. And it was funny, one of the people came and said, you know, there's four people in this office that just don't seem to be worried about anything. And you know, I realized it's the four Christians. And I said, yeah, well, it's true. We have nothing to worry about. And those same people that, w- that would come and say, well, do you think we're going to be okay? And, do you think you, can, can you? and I'd say, you guys want to pray? Yeah, yeah, let's pray. People who mock you when things are difficult are looking for someone to pray. Amen? Amen? They're actually happy that you're in the boat. Amen? Dude, if we go down, pastor's going down too. I'm glad he's here. <laughs> Amen? Hey, I'm glad Paul's on this boat. Dude. I'm glad he's, I didn't like him before. You know what? Paul's gone from prisoner to captain of the ship. Amen. They're looking to Paul for, dude, take heart. It's okay. I believe God. Man's popular opinion, popular opinions will fail and they'll change their mind in five minutes, but the word of God will endure. So he, he first, he tells them the word. Then he warns them of the consequences of disobedience. Let me pick this up. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now when the 14th, night had come as we had driven up and down the adriatic sea about midnight the sailors sensed that we were drawing near to land and they took some soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms and then they gone a little further and took some soundings it was 15 fathoms then fearing lest we run aground on rocks they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for the day to come look they're praying we're 120 feet deep. It's 90 feet deep. If they had trusted God's word, they wouldn't have dropped anchor. Instead, they would have let the Lord be the one that guides the ship to shore, even if the ship's destroyed. Amen? That boat I was on when I was seasick, I didn't care if the boat was destroyed. I could care less. By the way, hilarious. We all brought lunches. You know who ate? The captain and his mate. 36 lunches. Whose wife made this chicken? This is good. (laughs) Right? You can have the ship. I don't care. You can have my car. Part of the, whatever you want. Just give me. And here they are. And you know what? They're still holding on. They drop anchor because they're trying to save the ship. God was going to drive them to shore. the, the, The Boat would be destroyed, but they were going to be safe. But isn't it weird how we can do that? We can hang on to physical stuff sometimes when the best thing for us to do is just let it go. Amen? Have an eternal perspective. They, tr- they didn't want the ship to go ashore. They couldn't see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. They had been told that God was faithful, that they were going to be okay if they would just, no one was going to die. Look at this. And the sailors were seeking to escape the ship when they had let down the skiff into the sea under pressure of putting out anchors from the prow. So they dropped the the ship in the back, lack of faith. He told them no one would die. They wanted to bail out instead of trusting God. They're thinking only, could all the people fit on the skiff? There's three or 400 people on a boat. They're not all getting in a lifeboat. But they're setting it down. Some people being single-minded, thinking about themselves. They're not trusting God. Verse 31. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Who's running the ship now? 
Who's in charge? The prison I didn't want to listen to? Uh, the guy hanging out with God. By the way, you guys get in that ship, you can't be saved. Told the centurion. Paul, prisoner, giving orders. All others panicking. Paul trusting God and directs others to the truth. Guys, don't bail out no matter how severe the storm gets. Trust God in his word. Can we say amen to that? We want to get mad at God that we're in a storm. We need to trust God in the midst of the storm. Better again to be in the storm with Jesus than out of the storm without it. Sometimes he calms the storm. Other times he calms his child. Either way, God's in control. Amen? Verse 32. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. They took some godly counsel. God bless them. They went from getting in the ship. The centurion was told, we're all, you're going to die if you get in that thing. Cut it off and they let it go. They're exhibiting some level of faith understanding that, you know, this guy told us not to sail the first time, and we did anyway. That didn't work out. Maybe we should listen to him this time. Amen? So they cut the skiff loose. C, we're almost done. Verse 33. He set a good example before them. Look at verse 33. And as the day was about to dawn, Paul employed them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day. You have waited and continued without food and eating nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is your survival since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. They were wanting to hang on to the food because they were worried. And he's telling them, this is about to come to an end. Go ahead and eat. He's exhibiting faith in the midst of it. He's setting a godly example for them. And then it says there in verse 35, And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Don't you love that he took the bread and he broke it and he thanked God in the midst of all of them? He's on a ship, and they're worried about dying, and he's thanking God. Amen? That only happens if you have an eternal perspective. Guys, can we praise him in the storm? That's the greatest praise. Amen? We're not praising him because of what he's done for us. We're praising him because of who he is, and we trust him even when things aren't going the way that we expected them to. And then it says there, verse 36, they were all encouraged and also took food, also took food themselves. And in all, there were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. Now that's trusting. Amen? Okay, we trust. We've eaten. They threw everything else. They made the boat as light as they could make it. Final point, verse 39 on. Paul's a blessing to them. Look what happens. And when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. Before they were trying to keep the ship from running aground. Now they're like, let's run. That looks like a good beach. Run it into that. Let's go. Watch what happens. And they let go of the anchors and let them into the sea. And meanwhile, loosening the rudder ropes, they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas meet, they ran the ship aground, and the prow struck fast and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. So imagine, here they are, and they're headed to looks like safety. And even as we're headed to safety sometimes, the storm isn't over yet. And what happens? They hit this place, and now the ship starts falling apart and breaking into pieces. And sometimes we've been going through the trials of life, and we feel like we're getting out of it, and yet another storm comes. I encourage you, God is still in control. Amen? And keep praising Him. Faith is not faith if we're only faithful when the circumstances are going according to our plan. Now watch what it says there as we finish up. Verse 42. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim away and escape. Who would that include? Paul. We're indestructible until God's through with us. Look what happens. But the centurion wanting to save Paul kept them from that purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. So the Lord keeps his word, protects Paul. No one on board dies. How many surfers we got in the room? Who surfs? Look at this. It's in the Bible. Look what it says. And the rest, some on boards. <laughs> and some on parts of the ship. And so it was, they all escaped, escaped to safety and land. There it is. So if you ever want to say, well, surfing's in the Bible, check it out right here. <laughs> Acts 27, 44, man. They got on boards, man. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so the storms of life. 
We're all going to go through them, amen? There's storms of correction when we disobey God, and there's storms of perfection that God allows us to go through even as we obey Him. Storms of correction, let me give you some examples as we close. Worship team, come on up. Four types of storms that blow into our lives. Storms of correction. Remember Jonah? What did Jonah do? God said, go to Nineveh. And what did he do? Got on a ship going the other direction. Then the ship started to almost crash. And what did they do? Jonah went, it's me. They threw him in the water. Big fish swallowed him up. Three days in a belly of fish. And he got belched up where? Nineveh. That's a storm of correction. If he had just obeyed God, he wouldn't have been like smelling like a dead fish with all his skin burned up by the acid in the stomach of a whale looking like a crazy man walking on the beach. But you know what, guys? It's better to obey God. Storms of correction. Storm of perfection. The Sea of Galilee, the huge storm, was an opportunity for spiritual growth as they looked in the midst of the storm and they saw the Lord. So the Lord allows storms to correct us, but also to perfect us. But also storms of perfect protection. Noah writing uh, of his... Uh, the evil surrounding him, the things that stumbled him, and God delivered him out of that by putting him on an ark. And then storms of direction, storms that lead us into God's will. You know, sometimes we, we're headed in one direction, and God will bring a difficulty in our life to get us back into the center of his will, and we should praise God for that. Can we say amen? So, God's plans in the midst of the storm for our lives isn't always what we expect. The disaster, there's a disaster and not listening to godly counsel. We see storms of correction and storms of perfection. And the good news is, guys, take heart, God's in control. Can we say amen? Yeah. Right now, we're going to go to time of communion. Here at Calvary Chapel, we don't have church membership. If you're a believer, this is for you. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. He also said the next time you take this with me, as he was at Passover supper with them, he said, we'll have it together in heaven, which means this is something we do now and we will also do in heaven. So in a moment, what I want you to do, the worship team is going to play. I'll open the, the communion and you can come up and take the elements. I want you to go back to your seat and spend a little time with the Lord right now. Looking back, remembering the cross of Calvary. Amen. Looking within and examining your own heart before the Lord. And looking forward to heaven when one day we'll take this with them in heaven. Amen? Dear Lord, we pray for this time of communion. Lord, as we've looked at the storms of life, no doubt people will hear in all different types of storms right now. Now we come to the foot of the cross. We do this in remembrance of you and the greatest act of love in all of human history. Lord, I pray we would take a few moments to just sit at your feet, to remember the cross, to, comp to contemplate our own hearts before you. And to look forward to the time we will do this in heaven. Lord, we don't do this lightly. We do this with reverence. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said.